Adrenergic pharmacology is largely about receptor selectivity, alpha-1 versus beta-1. Cholinergic pharmacology, it is a different beast. To master this system, you need to understand a few key anatomical and physiological points. Let's start with anatomy. Parasympathetic neurons originate from cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, and the sacral regions of the spinal cord segments S2 to S4. These long preganglionic neurons carry the neurotransmitter acetylcholine all the way from the central nervous system to the autonomic ganglia. Here, they synapse with the postganglionic neuron, and this is critical. All autonomic ganglia, sympathetic and parasympathetic, use acetylcholine, and they all receive that signal through nicotinic receptors. From the ganglia, the postganglionic neuron sends acetylcholine to the target organ. At the end organ level, the receptors are muscarinic. There is one high yield exception, the sweat glands. Anatomically, they are sympathetic, but pharmacologically, they are cholinergic. The sweat glands are the one place where you find muscarinic receptors outside of the parasympathetic system, nicotinic versus muscarinic. Did you know the names muscarinic and nicotinic came before we even found out they are cholinergic receptors? Pharmacologists found that the alkaloid muscarine from mushrooms mimicked parasympathetic effects like slowing the heart, but it did nothing to skeletal muscle. So receptors at the end organs were labeled muscarinic. In contrast, nicotine stimulated the ganglia and skeletal muscle, but ignored the heart. So receptors at the ganglia and muscles were labeled nicotinic. Later, we realized this functional difference reflects a massive structural divide. Nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated ion channels. They are fast. Binding of acetylcholine directly and immediately opens the channel, allowing ions to pass through. Muscarinic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. They are slow as they initiate a cascade of intracellular events involving G-proteins and second messengers, which takes more time to cause a cellular response. Together, muscarinic and nicotinic receptors make up a significant percentage of drugs. Nicotinic receptors are divided into two types based on location, NM and NN. This subscript M is for muscle type. Structurally, they are pentamers, five subunits arranged around a central pore. When acetylcholine binds, the pore opens immediately. Sodium rushes in, the cell depolarizes, the muscle contracts. During surgery, doctors want to induce muscle relaxation for better surgical conditions, say when they want to facilitate endotracheal intubation or to assist with mechanical ventilation. That's when they use neuromuscular blockers that block the NM receptors, the NN receptor. Subscript N here stands for neuronal type. These are found in the autonomic ganglia and the central nervous system. In the autonomic ganglia, they mediate the fast transmission from the preganglionic to the postganglionic fiber, driving the entire autonomic system. They are also present on the adrenal medulla. NN receptors are the target for ganglionic blockers like mecamylamine. In the central nervous system, they are located at presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons in the brain, modulating the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine, glutamate, and GABA. Next, muscarinic receptors. They are also called serpentine receptors as they weave through the cell membrane like a snake. We have got two other names, 7 transmembrane, TM receptors, or 7 pass receptors. That's because they pass seven times through the membrane. There are five subtypes, M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. The third intracellular loop of these receptors has a specific shape. This loop determines which G protein it will grab inside the cell. This is the key to their function. If it has a specificity to GQ protein, for example, then it binds to GQ only, and that makes it an M1, M3, or M5 receptor. If the I3 loop specifically binds the GI protein, we call this receptor the M2 or M4 receptor. We can divide them into two groups, the odds and the evens. If the receptor couples to the GQ protein, it is an M1, M3, or M5. Acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic receptor M1, M3, or M5, causing the receptor to change shape and bind to GQ protein, leading to its activation, GDP is exchanged for GTP. 
the activated alpha subunit leaves the receptor and directly activates membrane-bound phospholipase C-beta, PLC. PLC cleaves membrane lipid PIP2 two into two second messengers, diacyglycerol and inositol triphosphate. DAG remains in the cell membrane and activates PKC by making it sensitive to calcium. IP3 diffuses into the cytosol and binds to receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum, opening calcium channels. Elevated intracellular calcium is the main trigger for smooth muscle contraction and the release of fluids hormones from glandular tissue. For M2 and M4 receptors, the mechanism is a bit different. M2 and M4 are the even numbered muscarinic receptors that couple to the inhibitory GI family of proteins. GI stands for inhibitory, note it. The inhibition here is not for the end organ directly, but for the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. The alpha part of the GI subunit leaves the receptor and binds to and inhibits the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. Since AC is inhibited, it converts less ATP into cyclic AMP. Lower cyclic AMP means less activation of protein kinase A, which inhibits the sympathetic nervous system's stimulatory effects. The beta-gamma part of the GI subunit also dissociates and directly binds to and opens specific potassium channels called potassium acetylcholine channels or GIRK channels. Potassium flows out of the cell, making the inside of the cell more negative. This hyperpolarization moves the membrane potential further from the threshold needed to fire an action potential. The overall effect is inhibitory, accomplished by both the decrease in CAMP and hyperpolarization. In short, M1, M3, and M5 use calcium to stimulate or contract. M2 and M4 use potassium to inhibit. Now let's look at the physiology. Imagine our friend Jack is sitting in his living room, totally relaxed. He is in rest and digest mode. Now we want to know the location of these receptor subtypes and the ultimate change they cause in the target organ. Among the five muscarinic receptors, M4 and M5 are primarily in the CNS, which we will cover in a later video. For now, we are interested in M1, M2, and M3. M1 is located in the central nervous system, gastric, and salivary glands. M2 receptors are the dominant inhibitory receptors in the heart. M3 receptors are responsible for almost everything else, all the squeeze and squirt functions. But before we look at what the parasympathetic system does, you need to know where it doesn't go. I remember this with the mnemonic B-A-R-K-S-U-S. These are the seven places where muscarinic receptors and parasympathetic effects are almost negligible or absent. B, blood vessels, most have no innervation. A, erector pili muscles, R, radial muscle of the eye. K, kidney. S, skeletal muscles, as these use nicotinic, not muscarinic. U, uterus, variable effect. S, sweat glands, have sympathetic innervation. Now that we know the exceptions, let's look at the physiology. The aim of parasympathetic nervous system is to conserve energy and maintain normal, day-to-day -day bodily functions. I. Jack wants to focus on near vision. Think of the receptor. Uh, it's M3. M3 activation contracts the iris sphincter and ciliary muscle. This causes meiosis or pupil constriction. Salivary glands. Jack is digesting snacks. Parasympathetic discharge stimulates salivary glands to produce copious, watery secretion. They have both M1 and M3, but M3 is predominant. The heart, Jack is relaxing. M2 receptors slow down the heart. M2 is so linked with the heart that it is often called the cardiac M2. By opening potassium channels, it hyperpolarizes the nodal cells. This slows the heart rate and slows conduction velocity. The lungs. The system maintains a normal baseline tone in the bronchial smooth muscles, keeping them slightly contracted during rest. This helps trap inhaled irritants. The receptor is M3. The GI tract, M3 activation, stimulates peristalsis to aid digestion and relaxes sphincters to allow food to pass. It also ramps up gastric acid and bile secretion. The urinary bladder, M3 activation contracts the detrusor muscle and relaxes the bladder neck, facilitating urination. The reproductive system, in males, M3 receptors stimulate the release of nitric oxide. This causes vasodilation and erection. Remember, erection is parasympathetic, ejaculation is sympathetic. In females, M3 causes clitoral erection and vaginal lubrication. Legends remember these functions with the mnemonic dumbbells. 
diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bradycardia, bronchospasm, emesis, lacrimation, lethargy, and salivation. Note that these are actually signs of cholinergic toxicity, which is just an exaggeration of normal parasympathetic effects. Understanding this molecular logic, odds versus evens, fast versus slow, the receptor pathways, and the dumbbells, is the key to predicting the effects of every cholinergic drug we will discuss in the next video. Thanks for watching Logical Pharmacology.